Hey everyone, and welcome to the Balanced Bodies Blueprint. I am your host, Vinny Russo. And I am your co-host, Dr. Aaron Stansfield. And we're shifting gears from all the conventional fitness narrative you hear on most fitness podcasts, as our main emphasis lies in preventative healthcare, adopting a holistic approach to nutrition, and challenging the traditional views on various fitness topics. Our mission with this podcast is to provide you with the information you need to achieve optimal health. And on today's podcast, we are going to be discussing uh, longevity supplements. So this was a question brought in uh, by one of our clients to Dr. Aaron in particular. And she was like, hey, I think this would be an awesome podcast episode. So I'm excited to see what's actually going to be brought to the table here because I feel like you have um, some knowledge in this area and you could actually illuminate some dark areas around these longevity supplements? Well, um, yeah. So essentially a really good question from a client who's basically living the lifestyle, right? He's, um, he's pretty much mastered nutrition and his diet, but, um, obviously we are still helping him, um, with accountability and with his health, health in general. Um, but he, because he's kind of reached the stage, he's wondering about longevity and he's, he's pretty young client, uh, and pretty compliant. And so I thought it was an excellent question. And he was wondering if there was any supplements that he could take now, um, at being a young, um, person to increase his longevity in the long term. And, uh, for the most part, I told him that he was, uh, practicing the lifestyle. And if he continues down that path, um, that I think he'll, he will do well. Um, but we're, we're going to shift, um, less on supplements and more on the endocrine system and what we can do for longevity. So what you bring up, is it going to be like stuff you get over the counter? Is it going to be like some black market stuff or is it just going to be like, you need a prescription for it? Um, so briefly what I'll do is I'm going to just talk about the endocrine system and actually, um, prescription medication that you might be able to, um, get, or people have asked about essentially, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into some supplements at the end. Um, we will talk about one peptide. All right, cool. So yeah, let's dive into it. Um, let, let's start off with this endocrine stuff. Well, first off, um, all of this, uh, uh, content comes from a really good review that the endocrine society did in 2023, where they basically looked at this very question, right? They looked at prescription medication and supplements out there that are recommended for longevity. So they are in particular looking at, um, do any of these supplements actually, um, have anything to do with increasing lifespan? Um, and not so much like they might have clinical indications for a person for a particular condition. So I'm not saying that they're not warranted. I'm saying that to prolong your life, um, then, then, um, that's what we'll talk about and that's what we'll focus on. So the first one they talk about is growth hormone. And I thought this was kind of of youth, right? Yeah. Well, so it's interesting. So, um, when they talked about growth hormone, they actually talked about growth hormone deficiency, Um, and, uh, this is very controversial, um, but the, the thought is that growth hormone deficiency actually extends lifespan. Wait, Um, wait, 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 wait. So, so you're saying that we're trying to, to increase or decrease growth hormone because like like I just mentioned, like the fountain of the youth, like that's what it's known as. So it seems kind of counterintuitive here or, or like. Right. So that's kind of, um, you know, we come from the bodybuilding community where, growth hormone is anabolic and it aids in protein th- synthesis. But essentially, um, one of the potential downsides is that growth hormones, growth hormone stimulation is associated with malignancy and telomerase shortening. Um, and that's been shown in some animal models. Um, it is secreted in a pulsatile fashion and it does decrease with age, right? It peaks mm-hmm. in mid puberty and declines by 50% every seven to 10 years thereafter. So one of the thoughts, um, is that caloric restriction and reduce, um, function in the growth hormone IGF one insulin pathways have been shown, like I said, in experimental animal models to extend lifespan, um, so, however, this has not been demonstrated in humans. Um, so that's where it becomes very controversial and unclear. Um, this kind of 
plays into um, caloric restriction and fasting, right? To prolong um, longevity. Uh, but in regards to growth hormone, um, basically there's no um, approved therapies for reversing the age associated with decline of growth hormone secretion. So even supplementing or, or decreasing it, that hasn't been shown to um, correlate with an increased lifespan in humans, at least, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, no, um, I was going to say, if, if anything, I was thinking the other way, where like, if you inject it and you take it, um, it's going to increase your lifespan because it's keeping you younger, so to speak. Um, so it was kind of weird seeing like, oh, well, because it, it declines with age, right? So you think as you're getting older and it's declining, that makes sense. Like it, ha it might have something to do with actually aging, but well, this, yeah, this is why it's one like, thing to remember, even that people that supplement growth hormone, because they may need it for various clinical reasons. Um, it is associated with malignancy. So um, you, you, there is a small increase in malignancy. And then, like I said, in animal models, um, it is associated with telomerase shortening. Um, and tel telomerase is um, at, and we don't know this for sure. We thought we knew that telomerase uh, are at the end of your DNA and um, it tends to um, be shortened as you age. Mm -hmm. And so um, we want those telomeres to stay long or stay on there and as, as plentiful as possible. Um, the thought is that that has something to do with aging. I don't know if it is as clear as we once thought it was. Um, but, and so that's where the premise of the argument comes that, um, it may actually be counterintuitive to that. Yeah. Well, this brings up, um, a, a peptide that, you know, I know a lot of people are trying to take and do take, um, MK677, because I believe it has something to do with growth hormone. I'm not a big right. person into peptides, right. so I don't know a ton yeah. about them, but do you have any insight in, in MK677? Yeah. So, so this peptide this peptide does increase, like you said, growth hormone levels by enhancing the amplitude of the growth hormone um, pulses, essentially. Um, there is a randomized control study in that was done in humans on this peptide. Um, and you can read about it in this review. Um, I think they do a nice job. Um, but basically, it was shown to increase the fat-free mass versus placebo. Um, but it did not affect uh, abdominal visceral fat, total fat mass, or strength, which is the strength part is probably a good thing. Um, it did increase appetite, and um, it did have small increases in fasting glucose and cortisol. So, um, you know, a, a bit of a catch-22 there. Um, and it did decrease um, insulin sensitivity. But that, the bottom line with MK... Yeah, it's very similar to growth hormone. It essentially does the same thing, right? Um, but again, um, essentially the conclusion is that studies with either growth hormone like um, peptides or secregogs as they, they're called or recombinant growth hormone, um, human recombinant horm growth hormone um, fail to demonstrate any benefits um, outweighing the risks. Um, essentially the conclusion is at this point, we need more studies looking at this particular thing. Like, does it actually increase, um, longevity or does it not? I don't think there's enough data essentially to say, yep, jump on this, um, peptide or jump on growth hormone, um, or, um, or even some, uh, caloric restriction protocols, if you will, for, yeah. for longevity, at least. Yeah. And just for everyone listening, um, if you hear a little delay or you see the video not really matching up, um, Dr. Erin is at work right now and her service is a little bit off. So um, just if, if it gets too bad, trust me, we would stop the podcast. So if we're going, it's it, it'll work itself out. So don't um, fast forward or pause. Um, so let's go on to the next one. Um, the next one that you have on the list is actually cortisol. And I feel like this really goes with you know, that saying that like stress is like the thief of joy and the robber of longevity. Um, and I feel like cortisol and stress are definitely connected. So does that have, is, is that the reason why? Is it mainly because of stress? Um, not necessarily. Uh, so uh, when we talk about cortisol in the body, we talk about physiologic stress. Now can 
I think you're talking more about like external stressors. Um, can external stressors cause physio physiologic stress? Um, I think so. Uh, however, I don't know that, um, you know, we have clear data indicating that. I think it's um, an associated factor. But when we talk about medical and, and cortisol, we talk about physiologic stress on, on your system. And, um, you know, the, the thought is that if you have too much cortisol, it can cause issues. And so the modulation of cortisol, because uh, we all have cortisol, we all secrete it and it is secreted, um, you know, uh, usually if you don't have an abnormality, it's usually high in the AM, for example, and kind of decreases during the day. Um, but basically the modulation of cortisol action could indirectly uh, mitigate age-related diseases such as cancer and dementia. That is the thought because cortisol, too much of it, um, can cause inflammatory um, reactions um, just, you know, in general. Um, so one space, one supplement that's actually promoted in the space is DHEA um, to help modulate that that cortisol, um, if you think it might be too high. Now, like I said, um, the thought is that there would be an abnormality or too high of a cortisol. And for the most part, unless you have a disease state, that's, that's not going to be the case. Um, and I'm not going to go into the physiology of the DHEA because that'll bore you. Um, but basically, um, it, um, it's a hormone, it's a precursor. Um, it, it is a precursor to make the sex hormones that peaks around age 25 and decreases as you get older. And studies have shown conflicting results. I know this is like a popular supplement for women um, to uh, to add to their diet, especially if you're you know on social media. Um, it's one of the things that that uh, I feel like um, people that push supplements uh, might push, um, especially as you're reaching. Um, menopause, menopause. Um, but at this time, DHEA supplementation has not shown major benefits in older individuals. Um, and in particular, they've looked at women and, and it has not um, been shown to be this um, super modulator of cortisol or have um, anything to do with longevity. Yeah. I'm, I'm under the assumption, like if you control cortisol, physiologic stress or not, like if you get external stressors, um, it can affect internally what's going on, um, whether that's working out, whether that's over restriction and dieting, whether it's going through a divorce, like you're, it's going to affect you internally. Um, but I never even really heard of, you know, DHEA increasing longevity. So I'm off the bat, like I'm assuming it doesn't even work. So what's the point of even wasting your money in it? But one thing that I did hear about, which I, I might be jumping the gun a little bit here, but <clears throat> you hear about it all over TikTok, all over Instagram now. And I believe Tony Robbins was a big proponent in getting this out. Um, he brought it to my attention. I heard him on a podcast talking about it. Um, but it's NMN. Um, is this legitimate or is this uh, quackery? What's going on here? All right. So now we're kind of getting into the supplement talk. So NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, basically, the thought behind it is it suppresses age-related adipose tissue inflammation um, and it helps with insulin regulation. Um, it can, again, improve mitochondrial function and neuronal function in the brain. Um, I think this has maybe been demonstrated in animals. However, I'm not I don't study animals. I study humans. So um, I'm not going to comment on the animal studies. Um, yeah, that's, but, what, that's what Tony Robbins said. He said in, they saw it in rodents or in mice. Yeah. Um, so to date, um, there are uh, three clinical trials um, looking at NMM oral administration in humans. Okay. So there, there is actually um, some trials there. Um, these studies have demonstrated that oral administration of NMN is overall safe, so there's no harm done and is tolerable. And obviously, my caveat to that is, is it depends on where you get the supplement, how, you know, how um, reliable that supplement is. Um, but evidence is necessary to establish um, the safety and efficacy of NMN. Um, so th there's more studies that need to be done. Um, and 
Um, further, the thought is that NMM actually um, increases NAD plus, and that has been shown in animals that's a little bit more direct. Um, the NAD plus um, supplements do help lengthen telomeres, like we talked about. However, there's little quality evidence that that um, one supplement increases lifespan, especially in humans, right? So basically we need more studies um, to looking at this in humans. Um, but they have said that um, taking the supplement um, can be safe. Uh, so, you know, people that are kind of uh, looking for something that doesn't do harm, um, maybe, maybe. Um, I don't think we have enough data to actually say it, it does do what 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 it does in, in the mice models. Um, yeah, but it's, it's almost more like, to come. Yeah, it's almost like, hey, um, if it's not going to hurt me, but it might help me, maybe I'll take the chance because I'm not getting hurt by yeah. it, but it might do something. Yeah. Um, I know, yeah. you know, um, you hear this NMN, you hear the NAD plus getting pushed, you hear resveratrol getting pushed now. And I know I did a post a while ago on resveratrol where it's like the amount that you need to, to have some type of right. clinical significance, you would have to have like, I don't know, 30 yeah. bottles of wine or something like that at one time. Um, so that's, that's the other thing is, you know, the, the caveat again with supplements, with any supplements is, you know, the source, the quality, um, you know, besides looking at the data, like where are you obtaining it from? Is it actually the right dose? Um, so, so there's more into question, right. Than yeah. than just, um, does the supplement help? Because, even with that, it's an unregulated um, area. And so we don't know if half the stuff that they're selling you is just powder or if it's actually NMN or, you know, how, what the ratios are. Um, again, the, the efficacy and the safety um, from just what's out there. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one on your list. The next one on your list, um, now that we're getting back to the list, <laughs> is testosterone, which sort of threw me a curveball because... Uh, with testosterone, I wouldn't think really longevity because um, I'm under the impression to where like you use, you, you have some type of prolonged use with testosterone. It'll lead to, or it can lead to cardiovascular issues. Um, so tell us what the thought behind using testosterone is with increasing longevity. Well, I think you're right. Right. Because they, I guess the thought was, well, it helps improve function. Um, and so the thought behind giving testosterone is it, does it improve physical or cognitive function? Um, we're talking about dementia long-term, um, <laughs> besides, besides, you know, having the benefits of people who might be low in testosterone. And I'm talking about men here, um, that actually have a testosterone deficiency and it is helpful, um, with sexual function and it does increase hemoglobin and bone density. So the thought is, well, maybe it has other effects, um, to help with longevity. And I think the the interesting one would be the cognitive function, um, it, and so that's kind of the thought process behind it. Um, but, uh, you know, there are large safety studies, um, like the Traverse study to value, value the cardiovascular events, um, as you alluded to, um, looking at, you know, five years of daily testosterone use. These are people who actually did have a testosterone deficiency versus placebo, um, and, and there are some cardiovascular benefits, um, depending on if you're actually deficient, right. Um, but it's not necessarily recommended for longevity. So in other words, it's not necessarily recommended for, um, the cognitive function or the, the physical functioning as of yet, right. We haven't seen the evidence that, that it actually might increase lifespan. So, um, you know, while if you do have a deficiency and that's a whole different set of, um, you know, issues, then, then you might need testosterone replace it. Does it increase your lifespan? We don't know at this point. Yeah. So this is more of like dealing with what comes with aging, not so much increasing lifespan. Yes. Okay. Got exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Looking at more like people that have decreased testosterone and a testosterone deficiency and replacing that, that, that is, you know, something that is done and there are benefits to that. Yeah especially the bone density aspect of, um, supplementing with testosterone. Um, yeah. so the next three on your list, I want to touch on, on two of them that in order, 
uh, vitamin D and cacao. Um, I agree with from what I've read over the years. So why don't you just touch on quickly uh, with vitamin D and cacao, um, and then we'll dive into the last one. But um, just how do you that. say cacao? Uh, cacao. How, how do you say <laughs> cacao? Cacao. What did or, I say? It's like a cocoa extract, basically. What did I say? I don't know. You said it funny. I say cacao. <laughs> uh, th that sounds like your drink that you used to drink that has the extract in it, or maybe it's just chocolate that's, drink. I don't know. Yeah, because that's what it's called. <laughs> anyway, uh, vitamin D and All right, cacao so vitamin D, extract. sorry. <laughs> um, so calcium and, and vitamin D, D3 is recommended for reducing fractures as you age, especially if you're prone to osteoporosis or you have decreased bone density. Um, so there is uh, data out there that it does reduce mortality and um, it is recommended for certain populations, especially populations that um, you know, might not be as mobile. And like I said, that results in decreased bone density. Um, so, so that sub supplement or vitamin, um, is recommended. Um, again, we're talking, isn't, isn't it kind of considered a hormone the way it acts? I mean, yes, it can be, um, no, but it's, it's a vitamin. It's a fat soluble vitamin. <laughs> yeah. I think we have to be very careful though, because it is a fat soluble vitamin. So you don't want to overdo it. Um, because it can accumulate in your, your fat stores and, and, um, you know, with fat soluble vitamins there, there can be associated toxicity. So, um, it's not like a water soluble vitamin. So make sure that you actually, um, one, you do need it, or if you do have decreased bone density, usually, um, you then will be recommended by your, um, uh, physician to, uh, supplement that. Um, yeah. and then and just Wait, just to touch on what you just said, because it's yeah. really important. Um, so water soluble vitamins, we can piss them out if there's and if, if we if our body's not using it, if there's too much and our body's not By using piss, it. He piss means out. urinate out. <laughs> okay. You can urinate out. Um, your kidneys will um function to decrease that toxicity because they will um filter them out. But before I was so rudely interrupted, um, but with fat soluble vitamins they will actually store in the body and bioaccumulate in your fat tissue. So that's why she brings up toxicity. All right, go on to the next one, the cocoa. Uh, yes. So uh, I like chocolate extract. Um, I didn't know this one. Uh, I had, again, this, you know, getting into supplements and kind of, uh, I, I don't love supplement research because there's not a lot of um, randomized control studies in humans. <laughs> so, but um, apparently there is for um, this extract, um, it does help with cardiovascular disease. Um, there was a randomized control study um, that cited uh, with uh, 21,000 participants and they took this uh, uh, cacao or, or extract and uh, multivitamin uh, for prevention of cardiovascular disease and cancer. And they compared that to placebo. And I I think there were some some benefits seen from that. Um, now, again, I'm not here to promote supplements, but just kind of discuss them. This was observed and so um, might be something that uh, might be slightly beneficial. But to be fair with, with any of these, especially cardiovascular disease, I feel like there's more uh, direct causal things that you can uh, personally change um, again. Uh, with lifestyle modification, how active you are, looking at your whole diet, um, what that looks like, your um, macronutrient and micronutrient content uh, before you you jump to some of these supplements. Yeah. And just because this extract is found in chocolate doesn't mean that you overindulge <laughs> in chocolate like nonstop. Like you'll do more harm for your cardiovascular system if you go that route than you would be helping it. So um, but that's pretty cool because I did not know, um, that they actually ran a study like that. That's pretty, pretty big yeah. study too, with 21,000 people in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, I'll have to find the, I'll have to include the link for. Yeah, so we'll do that. We'll put the, we'll put all the links yeah. in the show notes for, for the research that yeah. she did. Um, and then let's go to the last one, which, um, I feel like it's widely overlooked in terms of aging pleasantly, right? So um, let's dive into it. And, and how about you just give us the deets on how protein 
can make the aging process a little bit more enjoyable? Well, I think so. I, in general, and I know protein is called a supplement, um, but I, th it's I feel like it's technically called a macronutrient, but a, you know. yeah, I was going to say, I feel like you can get it from your diet. I know that like whey protein is considered supplementation, Yeah. Um, but I'm just talking about uh, basically as we age, we, we lose uh, muscle loss. Uh, we have muscle loss and um, and bone density loss, um, especially women. Um, and the muscle loss is, has been coined sarcopenia. It's actually a medical condition where you, you do lose strength over time. Um, and so protein, um, and you know, you can go on social media now. I feel like this is pretty well, um, advertised that, um, you should have an adequate amount of protein. And, but along with that, I would, plug the fact that you should do some form of resistance training. And again, that comes from, um, people that, uh, as we age and we do have muscle loss, um, it becomes harder to be mobile, um, because we get weaker. And so the more we, um, train those muscles, uh, the, the better it will be in the long term. And I've said this before in other podcasts, but one of the tests that doctors do, um, to, kind of test functionality in geriatric patients, I'm talking about, you know, older patients um, is getting up out of a chair, like just sitting and getting out, which is, if you think about it, is kind of like a half squat. And if a an older person cannot perform that task, um, we know that they're not as mobile and they might be more prone to have injuries, um, fractures. Um, you know, one of the biggest uh, mortality risks in, in older people are hip fractures um, from falls. And so th that's kind of, you know, as we age, that's kind of what physicians are looking at. Um, and so the more we can strengthen our muscles and part of um, supporting muscle growth and um, even muscle maintenance is making sure that you have adequate protein. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with this. And there's a lot of stuff going on uh, on social media now, especially with like getting more than enough protein into your diet. And protein, if you are creating a diet, is like besides calories, one of the most important things you need to make sure you're always consistent with. Um, just need to touch on this because I made a comment on uh, a video um, that was actually out by a pretty big company. And the guy on there, he's a personal trainer. He basically said, um, rule of thumb, always take in one gram of protein per pound of body weight, which is wrong. So that is not a rule of thumb. Um, you got to just think of it from the aspect of if you're an overweight person, 350 pounds, let's just say you're going to eat 350 pounds of protein. What if you've only been eating, you know, 150 grams of protein, you're going to jump up another 150. So it doesn't make sense. What I would do, um, just for people listening, if you really want to figure out your protein intake, you t you find your lean body mass, uh, which basically you need to find your body fat percentage and subtract the amount of body fat from your total weight. And that'll give you a lean body mass. And then I would do at a minimum 1.2 grams of protein per gram of lean body mass. Um, the more overweight you are in terms of body fat percentage, the higher up you could go. I wouldn't really go over like 1.8, two is like max. Uh, but anywhere between 1.2 and two grams is, is normally what I would recommend. So just throwing that in there for you guys, a little, little golden nugget for y'all. So on behalf of Balanced Bodies, we just want to say thank you for joining us on this episode of the Balanced Bodies Blueprint. We are committed to bringing valuable content. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we'd greatly appreciate it if you can take a moment and like it and leave a five-star review. On Apple, just go to the show, scroll down to the bottom and rate it there. If you're on Spotify, go to the show's page, click the three dots, and you can rate it there as well. And if you believe in the power of knowledge, share this episode on your social media to try and get the information out there to as many people as possible. And as you navigate your own path towards better health, remember that Balanced Bodies is forever in your corner. See you all next week. The podcast content may include discussions of medical topics and health-related information. However, the information provided should not be considered exhaustive or complete, and it should not be relied upon as a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment.